delight and a joy for us to be here with you today. I want to thank Pastor Bob for giving me the opportunity to come share what God has laid on my heart. And uh, I appreciate Pastor Bob. He's the leader of our section of uh, pastors here in this area and for the assemblies. And I uh, so appreciate him and his leadership. And I'm just excited to be here this morning. I remember, I think I preached here a couple of years ago and uh, preached on cultivating the interior life adding weight to the keel, and I used a sailboat illustration, Michael Plant, he was a, a renowned sailor that uh, circumvented the world twice in a sailboat, and, but he was lost at sea, and they found his boat floating upside down and discovered that the weight on his keel had just disappeared. And when the weight in the keel of our souls isn't where it should be, we get, uh, you know, we can be affected by the storms of life. So that, that was an important message, adding weight to the keel. Well, this morning, the title of my message is Stand and Defend Your Field. And the passage of scripture we're going to be looking at is found in 2 Samuel chapter 23. Now, this passage is about three of David's mighty men, <coughs> the mighty men of David. And um, these are at least, you know, the, he had more than three mighty men, but these are three that really stood out. And these three mighty men of David are recorded for us here in verses 8 through 11. So if you have your Bibles, let's turn there and read that. 2 Samuel 23, verse 8. These are the names of the mighty men whom David had. Joshua, Bathsheba, the Tachmanite, chief among the captains. He was called Adino, the es Esnite. Those are quite, quite some names there. Because he had killed 800 men at one time. Some of these names are tongue twisters and Tachmanite. I mean, I don't know if I'm saying that right, but uh, they must have had trouble with it too because they called him a Dino for short. So, so Dino was a great man. And he was a great man because it tells us he killed 800 Philistines. Think about that. Wow. One guy under the power and the anointing of the Holy Spirit. I mean, he had to have been under the power and anointing of the Holy Spirit because there's no way he could have done that without God's help. There was no way he would have had the strength to do that. I mean, one guy wipes out 800 Philistines. That's powerful. You know, an angel took care of 185,000 one night, it tells us in, in 2 Kings 19, but this is not an angel. This is a human being, one guy. And because of this, he became known as one of David's mighty men. Another guy is mentioned here in verse 9. It says, and after him was Eleazar, the son of Dodo, or Dudu, or something like that. I'm not, how to, I'm not sure how to say that. The Aholite, one of the three mighty men with David, when they defied the Philistines who were gathered there for battle, and the men of Israel had retreated, he arose and attacked the Philistines until his hand was weary, and his hand stuck to the sword. The Lord brought about a great victory that day, and the people returned after him only to plunder. So, here's another guy, Eleazar, one of David's mighty men, because he slew so many Philistines in one day that, that his hand became welded to his sword. I mean, can you imagine that? And, and he couldn't, they, they had to pry his hand off his sword. They couldn't separate it. Then, when we get to verse 11, we come to a guy by the name of Shema. And this is a mighty man I'd like us to, mighty man I'd like us to focus on today. In 2 Samuel 23, verse 11, it says, And after him was Shema, the son of Agi, the Herorite. The Philistines had gathered together into a troop where there was a piece of ground full of lentils. So the people fled from the Philistines. But he stationed himself in the middle of the field, defended it. He defended the field and killed the Philistines. So the Lord brought about a great victory. You say, Pastor Mark, how in the world are you going to preach on a scripture like that? Well, that, that's a good question, but we'll see what we can do. What we read in verse 11 is that Shema had had it. I mean, he was tired. I mean, the Philistines had gathered, and they were standing on this, the edge of this bean field. It says lentils, but we're going to call it a bean field today because really, lentils are beans, right? And, and since we don't use the word lentil very often, we're going to go ahead and use the word bean. We're going to call it a bean field. 
Um, if you're with me so far, say amen. amen. Okay, so Shema is standing there in this bean field, and all the other Israelites are standing there with him in this bean field, right? And so then all of a sudden, Shema is the only one standing in the bean field. They see the Philistines approaching, and all the other fellas fled. And, but Shema is standing there all by himself, and he faces off all these Philistines, and the Lord gave him a great, tremendous victory. So here again, one guy wipes out the enemy. Just one guy. What does scripture say? With the Lord, one man can put a thousand to flight, and two, ten thousand. Think about that. He took his stand in the bean field. It tells us. He defended the beans. He struck the Philistines, and the Lord brought about a great victory. So what is this passage telling us? Well, I believe that Shema's stand in the bean field was the tipping point. It was his stand in the bean field that was the turning point. It was his stand in the bean field was the very thing that God used to defeat the Philistines and to bring about a great victory for Israel. It was his stand. Say stand. stand. We're going to talk about standing today. I like. It, it's like he was standing there with all, his, all of his friends, and then he looked up, and all of his friends had run away, and he was standing there all by himself. It's almost like he said, okay, enough is enough. I am tired of this. I've had it. I am not going to run anymore. I am not going to give my beans to those Philistines. I am not going to do it. I'm not going to let them have them. I'm not going to let them take them. These are not their beans. They're our beans. And enough is enough. He had to have come to that place in order to stand against that horde that was coming at him. But why? Why fight over a little bean field? Well, I ask, why is it that the Holy Spirit made sure that this story got into the Bible? Why did he do it? You know, the, the Holy Spirit had to be selective because, you know, with all the stories he could have made sure got in the Bible, if he, if he put them all in there, we'd have to take two or three pickup truck loads of Bible just to come to church. Amen? So he had to be selective. And so why did the Holy Spirit feel it was so important to see that these two verses got in here? That this guy named Shema stood in a bean field by himself and wiped out the Philistines. Well, I believe there are a few reasons. A few reasons. You know, it says in Romans 15.4, it says that whatever things were written before were written for our learning. All the stories in the Old Testament are there for our learning. That we, through the patience and comfort of the scriptures, might have hope. So let's pray. Dear God, we just come before you. We thank you for this story. We thank you for these two verses that we're going to look at today. And we thank you that you put them there. And I pray that you would bring hope and encourage us with what you want to encourage us with today. Anoint your word to our hearts. Open our ears, open our eyes to see the truths that you have locked up in this scripture. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. So, why did the Holy Spirit see to it that this story got in, this, this, in the Bible? Well, first of all, we have to have a story, some kind of war, war story, to justify the evil of the mighty man, right? Dino got his shot, he killed 800 guys. Eliezer got his shot, you know, he went out in the field, whap, 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 and his hand was welded to his sword. So this has to be there. It, it could have just said Shema was a mighty man, uh, but then people would have said, well, why? Why was he a mighty man? What, what did he do? What, what did he do that made him a mighty man? So this is the first and obvious reason, but I think there are some other reasons as well. Secondly, and we've already alluded to it, but I think the Holy Spirit was giving us an example of someone who was willing to take a stand against the enemy. And this guy's stand just so happened to be in the middle of a bean field. And it's kind of a, a peculiar place for a war story. But really, I believe this is very significant because beans were essential for their living. They're a staple crop. They are needed by us and by them 
for substance, for existence. Their very livelihood depended on these beans. I mean, they needed these beans to live. So maybe he was saying, hey, hey, these are our beans. These, belong, these beans belong to me. God gave us this field. God gave us these beans. They're our beans, and you're not going to have them. Enough is enough. You're not going to get these beans unless you get them over my dead body. You're not going to get these beans. I think this is what he was saying. You say, how do you know? Well, <clears throat> I was one of the guys that ran away, and I heard him talking about it afterwards. You know? <laughs> no. no, but really, I think that that's what he was saying. He said, hey, we plowed this ground. We prepared this field. We fertilized it. We irrigated it. We weeded it. We worked hard to maintain it and, and to ensure that, that, that the essentials of life would grow here. And I'm not going to relinquish these beans to just anyone. My family is going to eat these beans. They're ours, and God gave them to us, and I'm going to defend them. That's what he said. See, the Philistines were well known for showing up at harvest time and pillaging. That's what they did. They were Israel's enemies, and they did it year after year after year. And Shema said, all right, I'm not going to let this happen anymore. I'm not going to let them have the benefits of my work. I'm not going to run for safety and security and watch the beans go. I would rather die than give my beans away. I mean, he had to come to that place. Shema probably stood in that field and said, come what may, hell or high water, I'm not moving. I don't care what the opposition is. I'm going to stand here in this field and fight. It's like he was saying, if you even try and take these beans, you're going to have to deal with me. You're going to have, it was like he was saying, you want some of this? You, ever see, you want some of this? Come on, come on, you want some of this? That's kind of, I believe that was kind of his attitude. You know, it made me think of uh, the commercial, uh, the Ever Ready commercial, the battery commercial, way, way, way back when, where this guy was balancing uh, the, the battery on his shoulder, and he said, I dare you to knock it off. How many remember that commercial? Okay, one of you. All right. <laughs> uh, I think we just revealed our age. <laughs> I actually looked it up on the internet, and I found it. And it was in 1978 that commercial was. So, well, I don't go on. Okay, let's move on. So, think about this for a minute. One man, Shema, prevented the loss of the beans. I believe that this story is teaching us a very practical lesson in a couple of different realms. One of them is in the realm of prayer, <coughs> the realm of intercession, the realm of spiritual warfare, at least for us, because these stories were written for us and our learning. All right, we're not going to go out there and kill people, okay? That was then. That was the old covenant. That's how they dealt with things. We're not going to do that here, all right? That's not, not, not what I'm asking you to do. But I am asking you to take your stand against the enemy and destroy him, the devil. Amen? See, Shema had the God of Israel backing him up. There's no way he could have wiped out all those Philistines by himself. There's just no way. He had Almighty God backing him up, just as you do. And just as I do. But what did he have to do to be a recipient of God's aid? He had to take a stand. He had to, in faith, say, I am not moving. I'm going to stand here, and I'm not going to let the enemy take what God has given me. And I'm here to say this morning, we need some shamas. Amen? We need some shamas who will take their stand in the bean fields of life and take their stand against the enemy and say, I'm not giving up these beans. See, all that God was looking for, well, maybe he was looking for more, but all he needed was one man. Hey, what would happen if a whole church stood in the bean field of this city and said, we're not moving, enemy. We're moving you out. That would be powerful. But all God needed was one man who took the stand against the enemy. One man with a wholly committed heart that would say, I'm not going to give this land to the enemy. I'm not going to run, and I'm not going to hide. That's right. yes. And when God saw that one man standing in that field against all that opposition, saying, I'm not going to give up what God has given us, God honored him and gave him a great victory. And I'm telling you, well, actually, it's not me that's telling you. 
Apostle Peter and James, right? The devil, like a roaring lion, walks around seeking whom he may devour. 1 Peter 5, 6 through 9. But when we humble ourselves before Almighty God and we resist the devil, what happens? He has to flee. James 4, 9 through 8. So let me ask you, what's he after in your life? What's he after in your life? What is the enemy? What is the devil after in your life? Is he after your kids? Is he after your marriage? Is he after your peace and your joy? Is he after your thought life? Is he after your devotions or your health? Is he after your prayer time? What being is he after in your life? And that's on a personal level. What's he after in your neighborhood? What's he after in the city? What's he after? See, we can learn something from this passage. Ephesians 6 tells us that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, against rulers of wickedness in dark places, and against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, it says, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand in the evil day. And having done all to stand... Stand, therefore, fully shod with the armor of God and defend the being field. That's what it's saying. 2 Corinthians says, For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty in God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself above the knowledge of God. There's a lot of things out there that are exalting themselves above the knowledge of God. There's a lot of things in here in our own minds and our own mindsets that exalt themselves above the knowledge of God. But our weapons, the weapons of our warfare, are not carnal. Just like Shema, he couldn't have done that in his carnal flesh. He had the power of the Holy Spirit. Well, God has given us the power of the Holy Spirit as well to pull down these strongholds and bring every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. You know, Isaiah tells us that no weapon formed against us shall prosper, but every tongue which rises against us in judgment we shall condemn, for this is the heritage of the servants of the Lord. And our righteousness is from me, says the Lord. Amen. God will be with you. You see, I think that God cares about beings. Just a thought. I believe God cares about beings. I really do. I think that this passage is encouraging us to stand and defend the being field. This is done through prayer and intercession for our loved ones, for our family and our friends, for our church. For our pastor, amen? For our neighbors, for our community. We need some people standing in the bean fields of Madison, Wisconsin, who say, Devil, enough is enough. We're going to fight for this bean field and the beans in this bean field. Amen? Because there are precious souls who need Jesus. The children of this community, praise God, you've got a day camp. We have a daycare up in, in our church. We minister to those kids every single day. They're precious beings that God has given us the opportunity to stand on behalf of. Amen. The youth of this community. Amen. Amen. I tell you, we need some youth in the, in the high schools of this community who will go in there like Shema and say, I'm standing in this field and for this field. And I tell you, if God saw a youth or a couple of youth or a group of youth that wanted to do something in a high school in this community or a middle school, he'd look down and say, ah, let's go. Let's go. Let's work on their behalf. I'm telling you, the college and career age of this community, we need some people standing at the UW, right? The other colleges in this town, the middle age, the elderly. There are precious souls out there. See, when God sees someone take a stand, it gets his attention. You may be the Shema for your family. You may be the Shema for your neighbors. You may be the Shema for your church, for your high school. You may be the Shema for your community. You may be the Shema, the only one standing in prayer and intercession for someone. And God will honor that. And I'm telling you, God will give you victories for your stand. We are to stand tall in intercession and prayer. And it's a battle. It's a battle. Have you ever fought a battle in the realm of prayer? I'm sure Shema sweat. Shema. 
You know, I'm sure he was out there and it was hot and it was gritty and it was dirty. And hey, a real battle in prayer is kind of like that too. You know, let me tell you, I, uh, this is just a side note, but when, when Pastor Bob called me about a week ago and asked me to, to preach, I said, yeah, sure, as long as you know it's okay with Pastor Brian and he can get me away and everything. And and because I work with Pastor Brian up there in, in Lodi. And uh, boy, I didn't realize it until a couple days later, but the second I said yes, it was like, whew, I was all of a sudden put in a spiritual battle. I, you know, and I realized a couple days later, I said, why, why am I feeling so stressed, such tension? What, what's going on? When did it start? A couple days ago. When, oh, that's when I said yes to Pastor Bob. You know, and I don't know, Pastor, maybe Pastor Bob's already told you, but he shared with me the other day that we attended a, a conference here recently. Um, oh, I forget the fellow's name that, uh, that led the conference, but he's a, he's a speaker that goes all over the, the world. What's Larry Stockston, that's right. And I guess he had shared, when he came to Madison, he had shared, you know, I, I, I preach all over the world, and I've never seen a city quite um, so demonically influenced than any other city in the world. I'm going, whoa, wow. We need some shamas to take a stand in this city, amen? You know? But that, that, I wouldn't go out and just stand for the city right out the gate. Stand for your family. Stand for your friends. Stand for your loved ones. And then as you stand for them, and they get breakthroughs, it grows, it grows. Then you have a body of Christ that stands up and takes the community. An individual can't maybe take the community. But you got to win your battles first. That's what I'm saying. But anyway, then when I realized that, I started to pray. You know, should have been praying all along. And it got better. Prayer and intercession is powerful. When you pray, things move. God hears. God answers. Praise the Lord. Well, I, I like what one guy said at a pastor's conference. He said, the devil may knock me around, but I'm still standing up. Like Rocky. You know, you ever seen that movie? I mean, we know who wins. Amen. My Bible tells me the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church. One standing with God is in the majority. Amen. Because he wins. That's right. yeah. Have you heard about the little boy whose teacher was telling him, sit down. Sit down, Johnny. Sit down. I'm telling you, sit down now. And he wouldn't sit down. So pretty soon the teacher sat him down forcibly. And through gritted teeth he said, I may be sitting down on the outside, but I'm standing up on the inside. I mean, when it comes to these things, that's what we're talking about, right? That's the kind of tenacity we need. I mean, we know who wins. We know who our dad is. We know what Jesus has already done on the cross of Calvary. For this purpose, 1 John tells us, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. Amen. You say, Pastor, what do you mean by beans? Well, I'm glad you asked. Not only do we need to stand in the bean field and fight for our loved ones and our community through prayer and through intercession, there are other things we need to stand for, too. We need to, to stand and defend what Jesus and others have literally given their lives up for that we might enjoy. We need to stand for the staples, the staples of our heritage, the staples of our faith, the staples of what we consider the essence and existence, the truth of the gospel. Let me tell you, the truth of the gospel is under tremendous attack in this country and culture. It is under attack in our school systems, in our court systems. It's under attack. And I think these are some other beings we need to defend. Some of the beans we need to make sure that the enemy does not strip away from us. I'm sure there are a whole lot of beans in the bean field that we could talk about. But I'm just going to cover a few more this morning. And the first one is, don't give up and waver on the authority of God's word. On the authority of God's word. That's a bean that we need to stand on. You know, Madison, Wisconsin's pretty liberal city. I'm sure you already know that. <laughs> And while there's liberal theology out there as well, liberal theologians say that this just contains God's word. And since 
that's their premise, it leaves it up to the interpreter to decide what he thinks God, God's word is and what it's not. See, so it's very easy for me to tear out the first 11 chapters of Genesis and go with evolution. You know, it's easy for me to rip out Jonah and, don't, and say, well, we don't believe in miracles. I mean, whoever heard of a fish swallowing a man anyway and spitting him up three days later? Ah, the author was just meaning that symbolically. You know, a lot of denominations run from and waver on the authority of God's word in order to accommodate the enemy's advancement in our culture. But this is God's word. Amen. It doesn't matter if you like it or you don't like it, want to be obedient to it or not be obedient to it. It doesn't matter. This is God's word, and it's a beam worth fighting for. That's something to stand up in the field and say, okay, you know, you may not like it, but I'm sorry to hear that. I really am, but I need it for my life. It's essential. It's a staple. And I'm not going to give up on the being of God's word. I'm going to partake of it every day. I'm going to eat the staples from it every day because it's more than just a bean. It's steak sandwich. It's milk. It's meat. It's vegetables. It, we need it for our very existence. Don't give up. I know you're not, but this is just an encouragement to remember. Don't give up on God's word. It's a beam worth fighting for. Follow it. Listen to it. Walk in it and partake of it every day. You know, our first foundational uh, truth in the AG is the word of God. The scriptures, both the Old and the New Testament are verbally inspired of God and are the revelation of God to man an infallible, authoritative rule of faith and conduct. That's our first foundational, uh, uh, 16th, uh, one of the 16 fundamental truths. You know, the Apostle Paul told Timothy, from childhood you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. All Scripture, he said, is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God and the woman of God, right, may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work, right where you live. That's the word of God. He told the Thessalonians, for this reason we also thank God without ceasing, because when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you welcomed it, not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God which also effectively works in you who believe. Yes. And he told 2 Peter 1.21, For prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men, God spoke as, men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. We're talking about the Word of God. Yes. Don't give up on the Word of God. That's right. The second thing, don't give up on the fullness of the Holy Spirit's activity in your life and in the church today. Pastor preached, I watched on the internet the other day, pastor preached on this a few weeks ago, the power of the Holy Spirit, Pentecost, and all of that. This is a bean worth fighting for. And I know you guys are standing in this community hold, holding on to that ground. Amen. I want to continue to encourage you to stand. It's worth fighting for. You know, after Pentecost came and went, the Holy Spirit didn't take a vacation. He came to fill us and fill the believer and remain. He's, he is going to be involved all the way through. Amen. He's our comforter, our helper, our sanctifier, our convictor. He convicts us of sin, righteousness, and judgment. He, he leads us and guides us into all truth. He develops the fruit of the Spirit in our hearts and our lives. He empowers us. He gives us boldness. He distributes the gifts of the Spirit severally as He wills. We need to be filled with the power of the Holy Spirit and willing to allow the Holy Spirit to move and flow in our midst. Amen. There is such pressure. Amen. You know, there is. There is a lot of pressure in our culture to have services that are predictable and comfortable and, and, and goes just, just such and so. But the Holy Spirit wants to be able to come and do whatever he wants to do. Amen. We don't need to be confining him. We need to be letting him stretch us and come and do whatever he wants. That's how we're going to see the enemy decimated in our church and in our community by letting him flow through us, amen? 
The fullness of the Holy Spirit's activity is a being worth fighting for. The third thing goes along with that second one. Don't give up on tongues, right? Scripture tells us that tongues is speaking unto the Lord and giving him adoration. Personal tongues builds us up. Pastor Bob preached on that three weeks ago. It edifies us. It also is one of the nine gifts of the Spirit. And, and the pressure is to back off and not want to offend anyone. Tongues in a service might offend someone, so, so we don't want to do that, right? Well, I say, offend them. Go ahead and offend them. If someone is worried about being offended, then they are probably offended already. So why not just seal the deal and get it, get all, get it over with? Stand in the bean field and speak in tongues. Amen? I mean, here I am, God. I'm going to glorify you. Yes, all things need to be done decently and in order. I'm not saying be out of order, right? Paul had to pull the reins on the Corinthian church a little bit, said do things decently and in order. But by whose definition of decent and in order? Yours, mine, or God's? What is God's definition of decent and in order anyway? Read the first couple of book, uh, chapters in the book of Acts. Travel back in time and visit Azusa Street. The birth of our denomination, right? Our fellowship. Visit Charles Wesley's meetings. I think that God sometimes has a di different definition of things than we do. Yes, all things need to be done decently and in order. But I think that sometimes we can take that to the way far out extreme and end up squelching the Holy Spirit and create an atmosphere where we don't allow him to, to move and do anything or let anything happen where we, we, we quench the moving of the Holy Spirit, where, where we say, God, you can come and move by your Holy Spirit in these prescribed manners because uh, that's what we're used to and that's what we're comfortable with. But, but don't do anything else or we might get freaked out. I mean, we don't maybe say that, but maybe we think it, you know? And all this takes place under the guise of keeping things decent and in order. Well, the fullness of the Holy Spirit's activity and speaking in tongues and, and is a being worth standing in the bean field for. Amen? Quickly, just let me cover a few more. Don't give up on the prophetic. By, by that, I mean the prophetic. Words of prophecy. Words of knowledge, words of wisdom, tongues and interpretation. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Yeah. I mean, Paul told the Corinthians, now concerning spiritual gifts, my brethren, I do not want you to be ignorant. They're beings worth fighting for. This is a prophetic book. So far, we've got the word of God and we've got the spirit of God. Yes. How about another one? Don't give up on healing. Don't give up on healing. God heals today. That is a being worth hanging on to, a being worth fighting for, a being worth believing in. God still heals today. If we open it up for testimonies this morning, I'm sure we could be here past noon listening to all the testimonies where God touched your life and he healed, healed you in some way, shape, or form. God still heals today. You know, maybe we should have a testimony service sometime. Have you ever been in one of those? What does scripture say in the book of Revelations? Revelation. How did they overcome him? By the word of their testimony and by the blood of the lamb. So if the enemy shows up on the edge of your bean field, what should you do? Just start testifying. Start testifying to the goodness of God. Start testifying about what he's done in your heart and your life and plead the blood of Jesus. I'm telling you, you do there. There is something powerful in a testimony. It reminds us. It stirs up our faith. It stirs up the faith of others. It encourages and blesses. This is what God did for me. Well, if he did it for you, then maybe he could do it for me as well, too. Try and convince someone who has been healed and touched and healed that God doesn't work miracles today. You know, some say that that was for, for the only the apostles' times. He doesn't do that today. What kind of a God would only let things happen for 33 years? I thought he was the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. Amen. Why would he start a church in power, then strip it of its power? I don't understand that thinking. He hasn't. 
we still have the power today. He still does healing. He still does miracles. That's another thing. Don't give up on the miraculous. Remember, God is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we could ever ask or think. You know, in this day and age, we need a miracle working God. We need to see God work miracles on our, on our behalf and on the behalf of others. When you don't believe in that, you strip yourself of hope. You say, well, it can never work. It won't happen. It just can't. No, stand in that bean field and hang on to that bean. Let me close with this one. Don't give up on the fact that God intimately speaks individually to us today to lead us and guide us. He wants to have a personal, intimate relationship. Some say that God spoke once and will never speak again. Hogwash. He spoke in this word. This is the Logos word. And he speaks to our hearts as well. The rainbow word. God is a speaking God. He loves to share intimacy with you in your heart. That's where the Holy Spirit lives. That's where he's taken up residence. Don't give up on that being. Learn to hear God's voice. God speaks intimately and individually today to lead us and to guide us and to direct us and to encourage us and give us wisdom and knowledge and insight. Amen. God communicates with us. Scripture says, my sheep know my voice. That is a clear indication that he's speaking because we couldn't know his voice if he didn't speak. Right? Don't give up on that. I know you aren't, but this is just an encouragement keep on standing for these staples of our Christian faith. I mean, we could go on and on. We could cover several beans. All right, just two more. Two more. Would you give me that liberty? In this day and age where it seems like everything is falling apart, don't give up on the fact that God is in absolute control. God is in absolute control. He sees the end from the beginning. He looks down the pipe and says, already done. Amen. And he knows how the process is going to work out. We just need to trust and believe that he's in absolute control. Don't give up on the fact of his sovereignty. He is, in, he is absolute, omnipotent, omnipresent, and immutable. All powerful, ever present, all knowing. I, don't give up on the fact that God is in absolute control. Yeah. I can go to bed tonight. You can go to bed tonight not worrying about what's going to happen on the news tomorrow. Because I know my God, and he is in absolute control, and we are more than conquerors through him who loved us, and we are very loved by God. And the same power that parted the Red Sea is the same power, and the same power that raised Christ from the dead dwells in you. Amen. Same power. Amen. Devil, you want some of this? Come on. Well, no, you, you don't want to go picking fights like that. But by faith, but faith is believing it. Faith is having that kind of tenacity. I'm going to stand, and having done all the stand, I'm going to stand therefore. And I've got some defensive weapons, and I've got an offensive weapon. The word of God that I can declare, and I can pray and intercede, and trust and walk in faith. That's what God, God's looking for some Shema's. Are there some Shema's in this church that are going to stand in the field and fight? Amen. Last one. Don't give up on the fact that our hope is in Jesus Christ. You know, hope is such a powerful thing. I've been studying hope recently. And, you know, I can take your pleasure away by removing your stimulus. You know what I'm saying? I can, I can take your self-gratification away. I can, I can take your happiness away by removing certain external things in your life, right? But you are in absolute control of your hope. No one can take your hope from you. We have all heard stories of people who have gone through tremendous trials and hardships. And we ask, how did you keep going? Hope. Hope is so powerful. Don't give that being away. Your hope in Christ and your hope in his goodness, your hope in his power, your hope. I'm going to ask Chris to come. You know, there are other beings we could mention. You could come up with some yourself. But I'm going to stop there. You get the idea. 
Don't give up. Shema stood and defended the bean field. When you stand and defend what the scripture says, God will give you the victory. It's promise. It's promise in his word. So don't give up on the bean patch. The stand that we take will pay great benefits, not only for yourself, but for others. Shema stood for himself and his family, but he stood for the rest of the Israelites that fled. Amen? It benefited all of them. They came back, and the, the other story, they came back and they, they, they plundered with them. Right? So all of Israel benefited from Shema's stand in the bean field that day. You may be the only one standing for your family. You might be the only one standing for that loved one, for that friend, for that co-worker. You might be the only one standing for them. Take your stand. You may be the only one in or around your circumstances or situations that you're facing. But when you stand, God will show up and everyone around you will be blessed. Everyone around you will be blessed. Thank you, Jesus. Praise you, Jesus. You know, I'd like to have an altar call, if you would. Maybe the Lord has been stirring something in your heart, an area that, that you need to stand. Maybe a loved one he's bringing to your mind. Maybe, maybe it's, a, it's a, a circumstance you're in that you feel like the enemy's just on the edge of your field wanting to take your beans. I don't know what it is. In the area of healing, in the area of family, start work, you know, whatever. But the Holy Spirit said, that's an area I want you to stand. And you know, if the Lord's laid, used this message to lay something on your heart, maybe, maybe God's called you to, to be... Be a, an Aaron or a Her for your pastor. To stand with him. To lift up his arms. You know, maybe God's laid someone, something on your heart. And he's saying, I want you to stand. Well, this morning, I want you to take a literal stand this morning. And I want you to stand up and I just want you to find a place at this altar. As, as Chris leads us in a, in a closing song, and I want you to say, God, here I am. I'm standing for this person, for this situation. And then stand. Follow it all the way through. Watch him work on your behalf in powerful ways because he will. Praise the name of Jesus. So as Chris leads in a song, I just want you to come forward if that's you. And stand here, and then we'll, we'll go ahead and close in prayer.